There have been times during these proceedings when my clients have said to me, you know, gee, it, it seems like it's our burden to, to, to prove our case. And as we know, that's not, that's not true. And I would submit to this board that the testimony that was elicited on the cross-examination of the applicant's experts, as well as the testimony from my folks, indicate that the applicant did not carry their burden. Uh, we, we begin with Mr. Broder, who testified back in October. He, he uh, confirmed that one floor would be seminarians, um, and that three floors would be open market, and he recognized that that three floors of open market could have a different parking lot. He testified that his towing company can't remove vehicles driven by visitors uh, to his buildings that are parked in the street. And also, he didn't know if car share was ground trip or if there are time limits. All those details, you know, will work out later, you know, when, when we're approved. Ladies and gentlemen, that's not proof, that's avoidance. Next, we heard from Mr. Scotch, whose um, testimony, in large part, had to do with um, whether or not uh, the proposed building was in keeping with uh, the neighborhood of the College Avenue development. <coughs> He admitted on cross-examination that there was no four-story buildings on White Street besides this one, or the Woodbury that was built. That no apartment buildings uh, exist on White Street with 50 or more units. Uh, that his proposed building did not have Federalist or um, Victorian architectural type details uh, present. He stated uh, and he admitted that the building will have a visual impact on my clients and the neighborhood. He stated that the proposed occupancy was well in excess of that which um, exists in the neighborhood. He stated that no other buildings in the neighborhood are shaped like an H. And he admitted that his building is wall dominant as opposed to the roof dominant homes for the remainder of the neighborhood and on Mine Street. Then we heard from Mr. Bogan, who didn't uh, do any test pits, so we don't know if there's any hydrology on the site. He didn't know the time of concentration or the method of calculation. And what we heard at the time was, well, that was all worked out between the board engineer and the, and the applicant. And you know, the board, the board engineer, folks, does not have a vote. You do. He testified that the base and low point is below the 100-year mean high water table. He talked about the fact that it's possible that improvements implemented by this application will take away further parking spaces on Mine Street. He stated that Mine Street could be partially blocked during a trash pickup or delivery. And he also stated that if there was compliance with the 36-foot aisle width on the, on the uh, ingress and egress, that uh, the applicant would lose the entire middle row of parking, which amounts to 16 spaces in, in the garage. Um, I submit to you that's the real reason they're asking for that, for that, uh, that variance. Now, um, Mr. Olivo was next. And uh, Mr. Olivo um, uh, did not perform any parking study on Mine Street, uh, but he admitted that uh, Mine Street was at capacity in terms of parking. Uh, his findings were uh, not based on field studies. Um, they were based on census figures. Um, he testified that car share includes the entire building. It doesn't prevent residents from owning cars. He talked about that, well, he didn't take into consideration other developments across the street and the college and, and then he talked, of, he said that the, uh, on, on cross-examination, the census statistics cover all of New Brunswick, just, just not Mine Street. So I just want to take one of those statistics and, and run it through, just, just as it is. There was a statistic that 34% of New Brunswick residents do not own a car, ergo, that means that 66% do. What does that mean for this application? Without looking at anything else, of a possible 124 residents, then 82 parking spaces you know, would be needed, not including ADA and, uh, and the enterprise space. Then he talked about this, this theory of building additional spaces and they won't come. Uh, he admitted on, on cross-examination um, that that's not an ITE standard. Uh, he said that he didn't look at the alternate side of the street parking rules on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, uh, and Thursdays on Mine Street. 
And uh, he also said that the 0.83 parking spaces per unit, uh, the 43 spaces would be exceeded. And uh, again, there's no parking on Mine Street, but again, the parking that, were, that the applicant is doing is okay. So uh, he then said that if a parking uh, permit is forfeited, that doesn't mean that folks won't park on the streets. And he finally said that he did not review the Buckers parking study, which Mr. Warnia did. Next, we come to Mr. Hughes' uh, uh, testimony. Uh, he started off by saying that most properties on Mine Street are two to two and a half stories, not four, which uh, you know his his uh, this application calls for. He, he then testified that the financial viability of a project isn't one of the municipal land use law uh, purposes. Uh, why is that important? Well, Mr. Olivo had stated in his report, uh, dated February 20, 2014, that the reduction of the number of units would make the project yield infeasible. That has no bearing on whether or not this applicant has satisfied uh, positive criteria and the purposes of zoning. He stated that although that no use variance was re required, he acknowledged that this development isn't RA5, uh, permitted in RA5, and that it didn't meet the IM1 standards because the building's not university owned. He stated that this is the only property on Mine Street um, redevelopment area, and um, as part of Area 2, and that uh, the parking variance um, is uh, not a result of the shallowness, narrowness, shape, or topographic condition. Of, of the land. He said this would be the only apartment building on Mine Street, and uh, he agreed that if there's a violation of the zoning ordinance, then it's a, it's a variance, not a, not a waiver. Then we get to the EIS that he prepared. And um, as was alluded to earlier, in it he gave uh, opinions on civil engineering, specifically drainage, uh, traffic engineering, and he admitted that he wasn't qualified, and never testified as such, uh, and he's not a professional engineer. He said that the buildings, which have now been demolished, by the way, don't meet the historical criteria, but finally admitted that they were eligible for inclusion. And he finally recognized that it's really Shippo's call, not his, as to that eligibility. As to the properties on both sides of the property question, he recognized they were set back closer to 30 feet. Again, this property is, is uh, five feet, I believe. The, he, he stated that the proposed building is bigger in terms of depth, width, uh, than what is there now, and in the neighborhood. He talked about the porch element um, and acknowledged that, um, that it's only on a corner of the building and doesn't extend across the front of the building, like the remainder of the, of the homes in, um, in the neighborhood. Then I asked a series of questions about what the EIS that he prepared didn't have. It didn't take into account various other licenses or permits that are required. It didn't uh, take into account water quality analysis, aquifer recharge, air quality, noise, damage or destruction to plant systems, damage or destruction to wildlife, steps to minimize uh, environmental impact. It didn't discuss alternate designs, and it didn't contain any map. Now, why did I ask these questions of Mr. Hughes? Because those are the requirements of your ordinance, specifically 17.08.040, capital H, 1, small h, small number 1. That's the only place in your ordinance I was able to find uh, uh, EIS requirements. He also stated that the building was not Italian or Federalist style, um, and as if the size, scale, and setback non controllers aren't enough. Uh, finally, he stated that um, Mr. Hughes, uh, Mr. Olivo's report had a, a level of service analysis, and it did. Next came the testimony of my clients. They're not business competitors. They're not objectors. They're people. Jennifer, Alejandro, John, and David. Just like you and me. Except, they live at ground zero here, next to a potential disaster. Mr. Mills testified to the reality of the parking situation on Mine Street. 
He stated that cars are parked illegally all the time on Ninth Street, irregardless of where the permits exist. In fact, he stated that the parking situation is so bad on Ninth Street that on occasion, he and Professor uh, uh, Drinkwater have asked, uh, to, to have had dinner guests or tried to have dinner guests over, had repairmen come to their house. And what ends up happening is that these guests or these repairmen, they end up going back to where they, where they originally came from because they, after driving around for a long time, they can't find a parking space, they can't get to their car. He made the point that depriving people of parking spaces is a bad way to, to encourage the use of public transportation. He said, he talked about the existence of big gaps in public and that relying on public transportation is not feasible. He talked about the large parking lot in redevelopment area two, which has been reconfigured so that the College Avenue entrance was, uh, or exit, excuse me, was removed, so that all ingress and egress is now on my street, across the street from the entrance to this proposed development. When you couple uh, that with the increase in parking at that location, uh, from 20 to 120 uh, spaces, it's clear that this is a, a very hazardous uh, circumstance. And there's been no proofs and no analysis by this applicant on that point. Um, he talked about the College Avenue Redevelopment Plan Area 2 intent contemplates development ancillary in support of college uses. And he stated that just providing for one floor of seminary um, and three floors of the market runs contrary to that intent. also talked about the master plan and the redevelopment plan, calling for the development to be in harmony with adjacent buildings. And his testimony was that this envelope filling, view obstructing, daylight blocking, bulk would not do so. He then talked about uh, some redevelopment guidelines not being met. Uh, first of all, first of all uh, uh, 1A, B, and C, and there were exhibits, I think they were 07 to 011. Um, he showed uh, the exhibit of the existing setbacks, scale, um, and uh, was uniform throughout the neighborhood, but it wouldn't be if this application uh, were granted by this board. It fails to meet one A, B, and C. He also stated that the design of the building falls short of the redevelopment area requirements 1C and 1F because the side and rear elevations don't match the front of the of the building for adjacent buildings in the immediate area. He stated that this, ap this application will discourage home ownership in the area contrary to the master plan. Next we heard from Alejandro Perón. He started his testimony by saying that the applicant supplied no data to support the Mine Street parking patterns. He stated that the plans show that the parking eliminates uh, or, or parking is eliminated on Mine Street due to the uh, improvements such as the hydrant and the uh, a access and egress to the property. Through Exhibit 03, he talked about concerns of excavation in the neighborhood, uh, creating sinkholes, landslides. No studies have been done on this. He then, and this goes back, this, my next comment goes back to the testimony of Mr. Bogan somewhat. He talked about his basement being four feet, two inches below ground level and how water comes in even though they went to the trouble to do a full-scale sealing of the basement only a year before. The applicant has not shown that the drainage will not impact the surrounding uh, neighborhood, particularly those down gradient from, uh, from it. He went through exhibits showing how the building's uh, shadows will affect them uh, very negatively. He finally stated that there was no proofs to verify the pre and post development rate. It's not enough to say again that the board engineer reviewed it and, it's every, and said it's A-OK. Um, then we heard from Mr. Warner, who was qualified as an engineer and a planner. He began his testimony by stating that the site plan uh, design is dangerous. He talked about how the garage should be one way in and one way out, and not just one driveway. He said that creates unsafe circulation, uh, and specifically creates a dead-end aisle without a place to turn around. He talked about the ordinance requiring 96 parking spaces, which is 
Um, it's not de minimis. It's a, it's a big shortfall. Unlike Mr. Olivo, Mr. Laborde did a parking uh, study of Mine Street, and it showed that there aren't any parking spaces available on Mine Street. And it also showed that not asking for permits is worthless when there's no parking to give up in the first place. He stated that the applicant provided no documentation for the claim that failure to grant a variance for parking would not be unduly burdensome. In fact, he said the parking variance is overburdensome due to overdevelopment, not due to physical conditions on the site. He said it was contrary to the public health, <clears throat> safety, uh, and safety by reducing uh, the parking requirement in an area significantly, sh significantly short of parking. So he had some conclusions. He talked about uh, the severe adverse impact on the surrounding residents of this application. He talked about the building not being in conformance with adjacent properties. He talked about there not, uh, there's not enough on-street parking available. He talked about the for a forfeiting parking permits is meaningless. He talked about the fact that uh, you know, did not do any studies to show that the numbers are correct as required by the RSIS. He stated that uh, the parking shortages uh, were verified by the uh, Rutgers and New Brunswick studies. He stated <clears throat> specifically that if there's no off-street parking, you've got to comply with the ordinance. You can still get de minimis. In his opinion, he said 5 to 10 percent, but certainly not 55 percent. And even if you do that, you have to do a detailed study. Not done here. To the extent Mr. McWarney uh, gave planning opinions, there was some crossover. I just, again, for the record, wanted to indicate he was qualified as a planner to negate the statement by Mr. Rainfall that his testimony not be given full weight by this board. Um, <clears throat> I believe on redirect examination, I asked him uh, about the parking standard. There were some questions about the parking standard, the master plan of 0.5 spaces per bedroom. That was never adopted. He confirmed it. Next, uh, Professor Drinkwater testified. He stated that he's lived on Mine Street since the 50s and that the neighborhood has always had front porches and small lawns. When he lived at 29 Mine Street, since demolished, he found historic artifacts there and was marked as, uh, we put it in that Ziploc bag, which somebody on the board found, thank you very much, uh, as 025. Why is this important? Well, Folks, there's variances here. There's ones that everyone agrees are necessary. And in order to satisfy the positive criteria for those variances, you, you must advance the purposes of zoning. And one of the purposes of zoning is purpose J, which is to promote the conservation of historic sites and districts, open space, energy resources, and valuable national resources in the state, and to prevent urban sprawl and degradation of the environment through the improper use of land. This property has been deemed eligible into inclusion into the status quo register. And Professor Drinkwater's findings only buttress the fact that this application will not only not promote this land use purpose, but in fact will degrade this historic site. He lives one door away from this proposed development in one of the oldest homes in the city. And in this area where he lives was a Revolutionary War dumping ground. Um, he talked about the fact that there were copper mines uh, there before the revolution. That's how Mine Street got its name. He stated that the building in no way relates to the neighborhood, that the bulk overshadows the neighboring residential area, that the uh, setbacks are nowhere near in line with the uh, neighboring buildings. It doesn't have a front porch or lawn. There's no green space, and it's not in harmony pursuant to the redevelopment plan at all. He indicated they weren't re-noticed either when the rezoning uh, took place. Then we come to the testimony of Jennifer O'Neill, who stated uh, at the outset that um, she had a concern about lightweight wood uh, construction creating a fire hazard. And the board decided against uh, getting more details and, and were suspending the hearings and moved on. She then stated that she was not noticed uh, when the property was rezoned and uh, to make it uh, clear uh, on the record of my position, this constituted not only a, a reclassification of the zone boundary, but a, a change of zone. 
uh, because the apartment buildings were allowed in the zone uh, previously, allowed one or two family, and now it's, it's mid-rise. So that's, that's a change in classification. Boundary lines have also changed, outlining 17 to 29 Mine Street. There's specific uh, requirements of notice. It was not. It was not done. And again, that's jurisdiction as I've argued previously. She then talked about the. She talked about 31 Mine Street for a moment too, and she said, you know, it's not an area two of the redevelopment plan, but it's owned by Rutgers uh, at the time of the application. It's still owned by them now, uh, which is interesting because the stated intent of area two is to provide development of uses that are ancillary or in support of college uses in the neighborhood. She lives in the neighborhood, just like uh, in a neighborhood, just like all of you do, and she doesn't want a building of this magnitude five feet from her property. She did say that she, that she would, uh, you know, uh, stand behind responsible development in this regard. She uh, she presented um, exhibits 0, 018, 19, and 20, uh, which showed collectively no four-story buildings on Mine Street. Almost all the houses had a uniform set. Uh, rear guard setbacks of 40 to 50 feet, two and a half uh, story structures with front porches. Um, um, on one occasion, she indicated that, uh, respectfully, the applicant's architect said that an apartment building was on Mine Street and that was negated by 019. Uh, she stated there was nothing similar to the proposed building adjacent to, uh, uh, of the proposed building to those adjacent to or north of 17 Mine Street or south of Mine Street, for that matter. There's not a single apartment building on Mine Street between College Avenue and Easton Avenue. And um, again, the buildings are consistent in height, scale, style, and setbacks. 020 shows more consistency of building height and setbacks in the R58 zone. And it shows that the proposed building will block views both ways. It will destroy the character of Mine Street. It's inconsistent with the existing pattern of, of Mine Street, uh, the proposed building that is, and she talked about her house being cut off from the rest of the neighborhood. She stated that the shadow study still remains the same, so that that minor adjustment that was made on the fourth floor is of no moment to the, the shadow study is still the same. We'll talk about that more in a second. Um, she um, stated that that will turn their property into a fishbowl due to the loss of light, air, and open space, which she termed as devastating. Apartments, the four-story apartments will run the length of the property, and the way that they enjoy this property will never be the same again. Note, there's been no discussion of how the other three sides of the buildings will impact on the neighbors. She stated that it would fill the envelope of the property and severely impact people who are in the surrounding homes. And she, I thought she had an interesting perspective. It's not how the passerby passing in front of the building from across the street views the building. Well, they won't see the fourth floor, okay? It's, it's not about that. It's about the people that live in the area. And that's something I'd like you to focus on in the deliberations. Um, then she, she gave what I thought was a great example of how, of how ludicrous this application really is. She stated that the new seminary building, which was, you know, just built, two and a half stories, and half the square footage of this building. So, clearly, uh, it doesn't make sense. Um, exhibit 024 talked about filling in the gap uh, will destroy the aesthetic character of the area. And P.S. As an aside, aesthetics is an important land use goal under uh, Section 2I of the Municipal uh, Land Use Law to promote a desirable visual environment through creative development techniques and good civic design and arrangement. This land use purpose is not only is not only not being advanced by this application, but frankly, it's being emasculated. It, it, it's filling in. Uh, it will deaden the aesthetics of the area. And it will, it, and this is how communities disintegrate. To offer an opinion to the country is, is, is frankly um, ludicrous. Uh, she reiterated that it was impossible to park on Mine Street on a daily basis. There's nothing minimal about the parking areas. Um, this from someone who, who works at home nearly every day of the week. 
She stated that Rutgers, Def, Cole, Hillel, the city of New Brunswick, and CMA are churning a perfect storm in this neighborhood with their entrance. That the, the entrance, uh, for Mr. Warning, that this is, you know, is, is unsafe, and it's compounded by the entrance to the facility across the street. For that matter, I cite the case Lionel's Appliance Center versus CIDA, 156 New Jersey Super 257, which gives the planning board authorization to deny a site plan uh, because the ingress and egress is unsafe. And to that end, she showed Exhibit 011, in which it showed five construction trucks blocking the entrance uh, to the Hillel uh, ingress and egress. And then traffic going in, into oncoming traffic to, to navigate um, Mine Street. She asks, uh, and I ask, that prior to voting, you put yourself in, in, in her shoes. If there was a four-story building uh, going up five feet from your house, and, and all the standards that, it, that I've argued and that have been testified to have been violated, how would you react? Finally, um, there were three more uh, comments that she made that I want to put on the record. She stated that people double park now, and uh, she questions the ability of emergency access uh, her vehicles to access Mine Street as a whole, let alone her property. Then, in response to a uh, testimony, I'm not sure who, who, whose it was, she stated that there was no correlation between students living closer uh, to campus and having fewer cars. Then she alluded to a conversation she had with Mr. Broder in which he said to her, you live in a city, you have to expect you might end up living next to a big building, right? Now, I don't know if that's Mr. Broder's concept of planning and zoning in the city of Brunswick, but I submit to you, it shouldn't be yours. Next, we heard from Mr. Gimmel. And he first uh, cited Section 5D on pages 10 and 11 of the redevelopment plan and emphasized that uh, the plans to be developed have to be subject to the uh, zoning ordinance of the city. And he, at that point, took issue with Mr. Hughes's position, which is essentially, well, since low and mid-rise is not defined in the redevelopment plan, uh, you know, then uh, what's proposed here, it, it must be low and mid-rise. However, he said, wait a minute. It is defined elsewhere. He talked about six zones that, that had it. He talked about low rise being 60 units per acre, which would mean eight units for this property. And he talked about mid rise being 50 per acre, uh, which uh, would mean 25 uh, acres permitted here. The proposed use, as I said earlier, far exceeds um, even the most conservative criteria the city of Brunswick has on density. Um, 52 units instead of 25. Only a zoning board can grant that variance, pursuant to 4055D, 70D5. He then stated that you can't find the density standard does not apply because the redevelopment plan does not define low and mid-rise uh, differently, that it does not aggregate uh, the bulk of other standards of the zone. Of, uh, the zone. It, uh, the plan makes reference to the I-1 zone rates and all other ordinances of the city. It kept emphasizing all other ordinances of the city. To not find that a D-5 variance is not required, to be, as I said earlier, you have to ignore all the other ordinances in, 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 uh, in the city. You can't do that. He reminded you that the goals and objectives of the master plan remain in effect when they are not inconsistent with the redevelopment plan. He also stated from a planning perspective that the design standards in the redevelopment plan are crucial in this application because of the issue of harmonious development in the redevelopment plan. He stated that there are still portions of the 2004 master plan that are not changed by the 2011 um, re-exam, which should concern this board. Uh, starting on page 193 of the master plan, he talked about uh, how it stated the conversion of single and two-family homes into rentals uh, reduces home ownership opportunities and creates parking problems and local traffic concerns. That's still an issue. The parking issues, uh, due to pre the prevalence of student housing, as uh, our, he stated was as relevant in 2015 as it was in 2004, still an issue. 
that you can't convert low density housing in multifamily units when inconsistent with the zoning in the area. Still an issue. This infill development isn't at density, uh, at a density consistent with the character of the neighborhood. Still an issue. It doesn't complement or enhance the neighborhood. Still an issue. He talked about the housing plan um, discusses the, the preservation of existing neighborhoods. This doesn't. Still an issue. He talked about uh, how, how that master plan uh, uh, wanted to create greater levels of home ownership. Well, this application doesn't do that. Doesn't do that. It increases rentals. He talked about maintenance and improvements to the existing housing stock. Uh, still an issue. Then he talked about the 2011 uh, re-exam. Uh, the need for additional student housing and new owner-occupied or rehabilitative housing uh, being complementary. It's, this application is not complementary of what exists on Wine Street. I think everybody can see that. It doesn't say build as much student housing as you can. It says strike a balance. He testified that the parking variance was not de minimis, not even close. He, he, he says that uh, we can't use the, the RSI standards for student housing when only one floor is rented to students. He agreed with Mr. Hughes that you can't have a C1 uh, for a self-imposed hardship on this application. But as to C2, he stated that providing less than half the parking requirement doesn't meet the C2 standards. It doesn't advance the purposes of zoning. It doesn't balance the positive and the negative, which is, which is uh, you know, to be instructed on later, I'm sure, when Mr. Ainsley. He stated there's no purposes of the MOU that can be advanced by this, um, uh, by this application uh, when the parking provided is less than half. He told you, when it comes to the data criteria, he told you to focus uh, on the testimony of my clients regarding the substantial negative impact uh, to their block. The applicant failed to carry their burden. He said, I don't see how you can say it won't have a dramatic impact. Then he got to the design standards and stated that these are the most important language in the, in the college ever redevelopment from his point of view. He uh, quoted uh, paragraph 1A, I believe it's on page 19, that all new buildings should be related harmoniously. He stated that doesn't mean at the corner. It means next to, across the street. And he referred to all the exhibits uh, uh, of, uh, that Jennifer O'Neill put into the evidence. He stated, um, the setbacks. He talked about the applicant having five feet um, and, and versus the other properties in the neighborhood, which have far more than that. Not harmonious. He stated that the applicant doesn't have uh, steps or a, or a porch uh, you know, in the front. Not harmonious. Buildings on either side are two stories with pink roofs. This application is four stories, and the roofs are all the way across not harmonious. 52 units versus late 18th and 20th century houses with peaked roofs, not harmonious. He talked about paragraph 1B of the plan, height and setting, not harmonious. He talked about the building design elements, the color, texture, facade, materials, not harmonious. He stated uh, that uh, you should strengthen the particular urban design features of its locale. And in this regard, he, he agreed with um, uh, Ms. O'Neill uh, in that regard. Um, that um, um, it, it would tear apart, and simply that, uh, again, not harmonious. He said to allow an exemption from the foregoing design standards. You have to sh find that uh, to promote the functional or desirable visual environment. And he posed the question, is it really necessary to build this big to promote a desirable or functional visual environment? He didn't think so, and you shouldn't either. He also talked about allowing an exemption if it relates to an element of the overall plan for design or redesign of a structure. Well, we didn't just deviate here. They knocked the buildings down. In short, 
He stated that the design standards uh, and guidelines of the redevelopment plan uh, were not met. The exceptions were not met. The building doesn't have to be this big. It doesn't meet the positive criteria. In fact, he said the goal isn't to build as much student housing as you can, yet the applicant concedes that the top three floors are a the market. He referred to the negative, first prime and negative criteria. He says, don't listen to me, listen to my clients. And as to the second prime of the negative criteria, he said, there can't be, uh, there's no way you can say that the application does not have a substantial impact on um, a parking standard that was just adopted two years ago. Now, uh, there were some, uh, a couple of additional folks which gave testimony that were not my clients during the course of these proceedings, uh, which I think bear, um, were interesting uh, with respect to some of the testimony given with this uh, application. Uh, first of all, uh, back in uh, November, there was a Nancy Beardsley, who, who was a pastor living at 35 Mine Street. She's testified that parked cars uh, uh, block uh, her driveway on Mine Street on a daily basis. She stated she gets a lot of calls to get somewhere quickly, and uh, somewhere in a hurry, and she can't, can't always get there. Uh, she also indicated that she experienced a decrease in water pressure, and no studies were uh, done on the new infrastructure uh, on how that will impact her situation that way. She then stated that the nearest grocery store uh, was closed, and uh, there's no public transportation available. Then there were some uh, comments made by, I believe it was Messrs. Kyle and uh, Labrina. The shopping being more than uh, half a mile away, there's no public transportation, and anyone who lives in the area needs a car. Now, my clients are within 200 feet, but uh, just because a witness is not within 200 feet, they can also object, and uh, the board respectfully must consider uh, the evidence presented by these parties, particularly in face of Mr. Olivo's testimony that mass transit is the justification for the parking area, so part of the justification. Then we heard last month from uh, a Ms. Gray who was a Rutgers student without a car. And what she said was, was that the public transportation in New Brunswick is very poor, and it takes her all day to go food shopping. In closing, ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't matter how many times this developer has been in front of you and gotten approvals, or has been in front of the redevelopment agency and gotten approval for a prior version of this application. Here's the first time for everything. You have to do the right thing by your ordinance, your master plan, and your college avenue redevelopment plan. The standards aren't met, and lack of hard data is at the heart of it. I ask you to deny this application, not only for my clients, but for the citizens of Wine Street. Uphold your ordinances. Thank you very much for your time and consideration. Are you prepared to take your now, Mr. Kelsey? I'm now. I'll never be. Yes. <laughs> I don't know if you wanted to take a brief break. I just for for time purposes, I will not be as as long as as these. Uh, please proceed with your summation, and then we'll be. All right. Uh, just as he's indicated, I also want to thank the board for their time and their patience. And uh, you know, I, I realize that it's been a long and uh, grinding process. And, Somewhat unusual, I think, many applications that we have before both boards in the city uh, don't really have this much of intense testimony and back and forth. And, and the time is a factor for everyone. And, and again, I do appreciate it. Uh, I just want to put a, a couple of things in perspective. Uh, this is basically a site plan application in accordance with a redevelopment that has one variance and one design waiver. To clarify, I think, the references to design waiver, there was a reference to a landscaping design waiver. My client indicated on the record that that, was go that we were going to comply with that requirement, simply putting additional shrubs on two sides of the building. The only design waiver that is being requested here is the driveway width, one that has been customarily done in the other units that they have built. 
And I think it's important for the board to understand that because much of the concern, consternation, speculation about what this building will do or what it won't do, we really come down to a site plan application with a variance. And a significant variance we understand, but a variance. And I think that the objectors want to dismiss the fact that this plan, not only my client's plan, but the redevelopment plan, the fact that it has gone through an approval process is not relevant to your consideration. But I suggest to you it's very relevant. It's very relevant because much of what is being argued by the objectors is that you should ignore the standards that are in that plan. And they're also going so far as to argue to you that there are jurisdictional issues here because you're really not complying with the plan. And I'll touch on that in a moment. But the reality is the process that got us here is very, very relevant because it, it says a few things. First of all, it says that the consideration for the detail and requirements in this plan were reviewed by this planning board several years ago. And a recommendation was made to the city council. Public meeting here, public meeting before the city council. And the city council then took public action and reviewed the detail of that redevelopment plan and said these standards, after public comment, these standards are the standards that we want the board to consider in reviewing an act actual application before it. Now, the objector can argue that you're not interpreting or the planning department's not interpreting those standards correctly. I submit to you that is absolutely not the case. We're not here, and I'm not going to take your time now to go point by point as to why he believes jurisdictionally we, didn't, we shouldn't even be here, and that there should be a D variance because the planning office historically has been interpreting what density is wrong. We're not going to get into that. I'm assuming at some point in time, one or the other of, of the parties sitting here are going to be arguing that before a judge somewhere. The jurisdictional arguments I respect, I disagree with, and I believe it's important on one of the jurisdictional arguments that I think it directly affects Mr. Jem's credibility, which I'll get to. But the process that this, this that, that has gotten us here, as I've indicated, has been a very public process. The city council is charged with the responsibility of its master plan. It's responsible for redevelopment plans, and there are a number of redevelopment plans that this board is very familiar with. I think the city has been very much on a cutting edge and progressive in the utilization of redevelopment plans to redevelop this city, uh, which has, has been acknowledged by the objectors, has been a very positive thing for the city. A public process where the city council deliberated and said these are the standards that we want to apply in the College Avenue redevelopment area and in this location in particular. That process results in a redevelopment plan that then goes to another public body the city's redevelopment agency, for consideration as to whether or not a developer who comes before it seeking to be designated is qualified. This developer couldn't be here tonight before you if it wasn't determined in a public meeting that it was qualified to develop this site. More importantly, the redevelopment agency is charged with the responsibility to determine whether the concept that's before it which is essentially what you see here tonight, scaled back what was actually before them previously, had to be and was determined by that redevelopment authority, a concept that conformed to the redevelopment plan. It found that concept acceptable and allowed us to move forward as a redeveloper who executes a redevelopment agreement to now come before you for a particulars of a site plan. So the objector wishes to dismiss that process and ask you to ignore the standards. Standards that went through a very detailed review consideration process that got us here this evening. And what are those standards? The bulk standards that we refer to. The objector, and, 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 and a particular issue with Mr. Gemma here, tells you those standards really shouldn't mean anything. 
They shouldn't mean anything, and I know why he says it, because he can't argue the fact that those standards are being complied with. He made light of it in his testimony when he asked him that question. But the reality is, in your zoning ordinance, the definition of bulk regulations, which includes the issues they have, setbacks, side yards, height, FAR, all of those issues which are the bulk standards are being, that are being debated here, are included in what's called the bulk envelope. Section 17.02.020 of the definition states that the bulk envelope means the three-dimensional space within which a structure is permitted to be built. Permitted. The bulk standards, the objectors and Mr. Jemba would like to tell you, you should ignore, despite the fact that we went through this rigorous process. The fact that this application complies with every single bulk standard in that redevelopment plan. Now the objectors would also like to argue to you in their jurisdictional challenge that, well, really the redevelopment plan is really being interpreted wrong, that it really is the underlying zoning that matters, even though the redevelopment plan specifically states, specifically states, that this redevelopment plan standards supersede the zoning. The bottom line is, through a rigorous process, we develop redevelopment and bulk standards that are before this board that this applicant complies with. And it's relevant, important for you to consider that, despite all the jurisdictional nuances that the, or that the objector would like to have you in move off course as to what the fundamental thing that is before you this evening, which is to look at this site plan, recognize that it, that it meets these bulk requirements, and move on to what really I understand is probably the, the heart of this, which is the parking variance. And again, I really, I really want to emphasize that I think, Mr. Jenna, and I understand that as, as a licensed professional, a planner has testified many times. I understand why he has to make the argument. But it really, really should bother you in, in looking at his credibility. For someone to look at what is so fundamental to the municipal land use law, that these bulk requirements are rights that an applicant has, just as much as limitations that the applicant has, that he's permitted to utilize, should be ignored and, and stated to you that they really don't mean anything. He said, yeah, they're there. Yeah, they comply with them, but you should consider that. Well, of course you have to consider that. It's fundamental to what you do. Um, I, I will acknowledge to you that in the redevelopment plan, <coughs> And, and as indicated by Mr. MacArthur, there are certain design guidelines that there's been a lot of discussion about the type of building, uh, the nature of the building itself, what, you know, what it's made of, how it looks. All, all of that is, is very relevant. Um, and I think it's important that you, can re that you should be looking at that and looking at what is referred to in the redevelopment plan as the, the general and, and guidelines as opposed to the specific guidelines, both of which are in the plan. And I argue to you that all of my witnesses, in one form or another, have touched upon those issues before you. They've talked about the general guidelines. Mr. Schock did it, uh, Kenan Hughes did it. And I want to point out a number of things that are in those design standards. And I'm, I'm going to try not to read the whole thing to you. I don't want to do that. I'm trying not to take a lot of time. But first of all, the overall design concept, which is identified uh, on page uh, 19 of the redevelopment plan, states the proposed, while the pro proposed development permitted is of a higher density than is characteristic of the buildings currently on the campus, this plan itself anticipates verbally that you're going to look at development in this redevelopment area that is of a higher density than is on the campus. Consistent with what we've argued to you are bulk standards that we're complying with, 
which provide for development that's of a higher intensity than is characteristic on the campus. It also refers to how to look at building height and, and setting the building, and it refers to step designs may be appropriate to preserve lights views and to reinforce the scale of a particular site or an assemblage of lots, the height massing and siting of buildings need special care to reinforce the existing relationships. That's a very valid standard. My clients have testified, their professionals have testified, what they have done to meet that requirement. And again, acknowledging that initially, the initial plan before this board had some deficiencies that had been corrected. And not only in terms of the, the, the um, the step design that was now utilized in order to step from the fourth floor being strictly the whole building to stepping back the front of the building. And despite what Mr. MacArthur said, the plan is the plan does anticipate what that view is for the traveling public, not just people that are living next door. It has to do with what a pedestrian sees when they walk on, on the sidewalk. It also refers to building design elements. The selection of a building design elements, for example, in the use of materials, fenestration, color, texture, should ensure that the treatment is harmonious, harmonious with that prevalent in the area. And then it goes, again, we, again, I'll touch on it in a moment, but the testimony that was provided by my clients dealt specifically with that. Then there are specific buildings, uh, I'm sorry, specific uh, standards. First, regarding massing. The plan refers to large horizontal buildings of limited height should be broken down into segments having vertical orientation. Reputation, reputa I'm sorry, reputa re reputa repetition of bays and traditional facade elements create patterns which help establish a sense of scale while allowing individual identity of each storefront. Mr. Schock testified as to specifically taking that in consideration in how the building facade ultimately came to, to being the way it is. Um, scale, a human scale should be achieved at ground level and along street frontages and entryways through the use of such elements as windows, doors, transoms, sidelines, columns, awnings, stoops, bulkheads, areaways. Again, testimony that was provided by my clients as to how they complied with that by the types of materials they're using, stepping back the fourth floor, adding a porch element, uh, looking at the, 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 the building vertically rather than looking at it as a mass wall and, and, and horizontal utilization. Um, I would uh, like to specifically identify, in layman's terms, Mr. Broder indicated that they have completely redesigned the building facade by changing the modern style to a traditional residential design. Colonial brick shape and clapboard siding along with double hung windows are simple but attractive residential finishes that have been introduced into the new building design. A front dormers, mansard roofing, dental moldings, and front entrance porch all help to tie this building into the immediate neighborhood. Again, from the developer's perspective, it's the thought process that went into the direction to the, to the design architect to meet those requirements that are, that are in the design guidelines in order to make this building more compatible to, to, to the neighborhood, recognizing that in the plan itself, it anticipates a higher density building. Uh, uh, Mr. Bro Bro uh, uh, Mr. Broder also indicated that we lowered the front of the building from four to three stories. The new front roof line will now tie with the height of the neighboring homes. This change has been made even though at four stories, the original building was within zoning compliance for height. And then finally, by stepping back both front corners, we've softened the feel of the building um, and have eliminated the transformer variance. You recall that the, one of the original things in the application was a variance for a transformer front. All that's been eliminated. Through the process of bringing this building to the point where it can reasonably meet those design guidelines in the spirit of what they're entitled to be able to build uh, in accordance with the bulk standards. With regard to, to a little bit more of the detail, I do want to refer to the environmental impact statement because the environmental impact statement, even though being criticized uh, for reasons I'm not really clear on, uh, 
it's, an, it's a, several of these elements that I think it's important for me to reinforce them because they're laid out specifically in uh, the environmental impact statement. In terms of building height, the proposed building, which is now 39.56 feet, is just approximately 4. Point feet taller than the existing 17 Mine Street structure. So the building that was there previously, even at the fourth story level, this building is only four and a half feet higher than what, what was there, that now is not there, but was there when we started this application. More importantly, at the time, that 17 Mine Street building that was originally there was only one and a half feet off the property line. So you had a building that was only four and a half feet lower than what's being proposed. That was one and a half feet off the property line. Now, this new building is five feet off the property line. In accordance with and, and in compliance with the bulk requirements of the, of the plan. Porch element. A key aesthetic consideration is the appearance of the proposed building at the northeasterly corner of the property, where the bend in Mine Street exposes the front side facades. For this visible location, the architect has designed an elevated porch with a roof which wraps around the corner of the building into the side yard. The porch feature is one that is commonly found among the buildings along Mine Street. Good examples include 13 and 31 Mine Street. It provides a pedestrian-oriented and aesthetically compatible appearance of the building from the viewpoint of a pedestrian or driver along Mine Street. The front yard setback, which has been discussed. The proposed building will set back 10 feet from the Mine Street right away. Once again, in conformance with the setback requirements of the bulk standards. And it's not uncommon on the street. The setbacks of the existing buildings along Mine Street vary from approximately 5 to 10 feet, for example, 13 Mine Street, to approximately 30 feet, which is 15 Mine Street right next door, which we, we recognize. In fact, providing a front porch with a small staircase or stoop to provide pedestrian access from the sidewalk is commonplace along Mine Street. Examples of that include 14, 16, 28, and 30, and 32 Mine Street. And they're located across the street. Finally, with regard to the exterior materials, which I've indicated previously, the use of brick and traditional siding and shakes are the primary facade materials and draw upon architectural vocabulary found within the existing buildings along Mine Street. The existing structures provide a number of examples of vernacular architecture that contains certain elements of high style, such as Italianate, Second Empire, and Queen Anne Revival. The proposed building is entirely appropriate within this context because it utilizes many of the same design elements such as partial mansard roofs, a port single shakes and overhanging eaves, as well as double hung windows and dormers, which are all commonplace along Mine Street. Uh, and finally, with regard to massing, the use of partial mansard roof and dormers has the particular effect of providing depth and visual interest to the facade and creates the appearance of a three-story roof line when viewed from the street. Along with the aforementioned materials and design elements, the masking of the front facade forms a visually compatible building within the architectural context of Mine Street. So, yes, there are design guidelines, general and specific. Yes, one can, can look at these things in a subjective manner. They're not simply capable of being objectively reviewed, viewed as a 10-foot setback or a five-yard setback. But the applicant has gone to great lengths through the process of change in this building to meet those design guidelines in the redevelopment plan in order to create a building which admittedly in this redevelopment plan is intended to be a higher density building to make it visually and locationally compatible as best it can be with regard to the properties that are in that area. And that's what those design guidelines are, are intended for. And let me turn to the, to the, really I think, the biggest issue here, which is the parking areas. Admittedly, 43 spaces where 96 are required. And we recognize that it's a variance. So there's testimony that's necessary to be provided with regard to a C2 variance. C2 variances, and I know that this board has heard many times, Essentially, the law says the benefits have to outweigh the detriments. That's what a C2 is. It's the catch-all variance that the municipal land use law enacted a number of years ago to, to eliminate 
having to look at the specific aspects of a property in terms of its topographics, as its unusual or regular shapes, it's the catch-all. Do the benefits outweigh the detriments? As we know, the parking requirement set forth in the plan is based strictly on the RSIS standard imposed statewide by the state. This blanket standard is applied statewide in cities and in both urban and suburban locations without any regard for any local conditions. It's a standard that history, and in New Brunswick in particular, cannot sensibly be applied statewide in all the different and varied situations without some ability to consider uniquely local conditions. That's why RSIS, through the DCA, gives great latitude to local reviewers such as yourself to vary these standards. And I want to reinforce this because I think it, it is a critical component here. To that end, the City of New Brunswick, by letter dated May 27, 2014, was directly advised by the DCA that it, as it relates to parking, and although Mr. MacArthur said some state bureaucrat, some state bureaucrat, which happens to be the bureaucrat that deals completely with RSIS standards in this state, but he's some state bureaucrat. Only one of the resolutions has a variation to the RSI. You remember that Mr. Patterson and a number of approvals down to the state and was responded to in May of this year. It dealt with the number of parking spaces. That particular application approved fewer parking spaces for an 82 unit development than required by Table 4.4 of RSIS. The reason was proximity to other transportation options. The Site Improvement Advisory Board intends for local reviewers to have a great deal of flexibility over parking. NJAC, the Administrative Code 5-21-4.14c specifies alternate standards to those shown in Table 4.4 shall be accepted if the applicant demonstrates these standards better reflect local conditions. Factors affecting minimum number of parking spaces include household characteristics, availability of mass transit, urban versus suburban location, and available off-site parking resources. Notice is unnecessary because the rule is written to allow reviewers to allow exceptions. What, is, what does that mean? We acknowledge that we still are required to have variance. But the state imposed standards that gave rise to the standard that was in that redevelopment plan to begin with is recognized by the state as one that you can vary taking into consideration local conditions. And the testimony provided is that that standard was in there because it was required to be in there. It's required to be there, but it can be varied. Even the objector's professional traffic consultant, Mr. Woodley-Bloney, admitted that this board has the power, power to vary that standard. The city did not freely create the standard, but it was compelled to impose it. So let us look at the support for such a variance that has now been te testified to in this matter. So I'm going to go through uh, a few of the items that, that I think are critical for you to, to look at when you consider whether or not this variance has been justified. The city's 2012 master plan re-examination report recommended a far lower standard for housing involving student housing. It's really fascinating. Here you have the redevelopment plan approved in 2012. It puts a standard in, in the plan for parking that's required by the state. And in this, at the same time, does a master plan re-examination report that says the following. 2012 master plan re-examination -exam, re recommended one space per unit or 0 0.5 spaces per bedroom as a potential ratio for development that includes student housing. And I know I'd like to argue, well, it's, 
I, I think we have to use reason here. Yes, it's open market housing. Yes, we're going to have students on the first floor. Does anybody realistically think that this is not going to be predominantly student housing building? We all know it is. That's where it's located. That's a primary spot for student housing. I think we have to be realistic here. The master plan re-examination re report states that it should establish realistic parking ratios for on-site parking. If the project is limited to areas of walkability and mass transit access, then parking ratios could be lower than those of more suburban areas. If student housing is anticipated, a ratio of one on-site space per unit and or 0 0.05 spaces per bedroom should be considered. If we were to apply that re-examination standard here, we don't need a parking variance because we comply with it. So the irony here is we're stuck with a standard that nobody locally believes in, that the state allows you to vary from, that our own master plan in the same year recommends something different, and we comply with it. I think that's compelling for this board to consider. To compound the issue, and, and again, I don't want to be overly critical of, of the objectors, <coughs> professionals, but it really is, is ironic here that Mr. Lubomio, who testified with regard to, yes, you can vary the standard, but no, you didn't do a study. It says you have to do a study. You have to do a study. But he cites a master <coughs> plan thesis that reads, he cites this in support of their position. And I, as I indicated, through, as he indicated through my cross-examination, this is what it actually says. Student-oriented housing developments experience lower trip generation rates than uh, generic multifamily apartments or condominiums. This phenomenon can be attributed to many students not owning cars and the fact that many trips are close to the campus and can be completed by bicycling, walking, or using public transit. The results suggest that student housing generates approximately one-third the amount of traffic as generic apartments. Now, that was their expert. That was his report. All of this seems to be moving us to the logical conclusion of what this parking standard really ought to be here. Yes, we need a variance because we technically are required to, but the facts and circumstances suggest it's justifiable. Actual experience. This became a, a little bit of a pushback between myself and Ms. Lugonia and also Mr. Gemma. Actual experience. You know, we're used to hearing traffic consultants, no offense, talk about IT standards and talk about what the studies show and they talk about these things that are national, all very relevant, I think, for, for, for us, because we, we don't have a lot of guidance. We don't have a lot of things that we can actually point to to say what really works, except here. Here we do. Here we have an applicant who actually developed similar projects in the same locations. I mean, you can... You, the, they pushed back against me about the locations. Well, two of them were around the corner, and the other is a block from campus, or the others are a block from campus, just like this project is. And they pushed back and said, it's not relevant. We shouldn't be looking at that. Well, of course they didn't want to look at it. The reason they didn't want to look at it is because it hurt them. Because here we have actual experience of projects of a very similar form, which is why this project is developed the way it is, because it's been working. We have projects that have come online just within the last few years that have been either developed directly by construction management or they've been engaged in the construction or the, or the design. You have 66 Sycard Street, 34 units with 31 spaces. Six Sycard Street, 23 units with 18 spaces. That's 0.88%. 15 Union Street, 18 units and 11 spaces, 0.6%. 
50 Union Street, which is 24 units and 17 spaces, 0.7. If you want to do the match, I should, so you do it, 43 to 52 is 0 0.83, 0 0.83. Then you have two projects that have recently been approved, one of which is now online, which is 12 Bartlett Street, 59 units with 39 spaces, which is 0.66. Well, I asked Mr. Lamoni, did you look at those? Wouldn't they be relevant? Wouldn't it help to know, well, we're lucky because we don't have to rely on the ITT book that maybe has stuff from Minnesota, whatever. We can look to see what's working around the corner. It doesn't work. And the answer was, he didn't do it. Okay. But remember when I asked him what his reason was? His reason was, quote, it wasn't my client's charge. In other words, he didn't get paid to do it. He didn't say it wouldn't have been relevant. He said he get paid to do it, so he didn't do it. I think that it, that undermines the credibility of that witness. I don't want to be too critical of him. I understand if he didn't get paid to do it, that's fine. But we're missing something that was relevant to consider here that my clients considered when they designed the project. They just didn't back into a number. They don't want a project that they're going to own and operate to fail. They look to see what's worked. They've been on the cutting edge of developing these properties in, in the sixth ward because the university's not doing it, nobody else is doing it, but they've figured out the formula that works. And I asked, and I, and, and I, I would have hoped that their professionals would have at least walked into the garages or opened to see, are they working? Are there empty spaces? Talk to the students. Find out who lives there. Not relevant. And I challenged Mr. Jenna too, and I challenged him on this because as a planner, I felt that that's something that he should have least considered. And he kind of laughed and he said, no, nah, it wasn't important, it didn't matter. And I think that's a failure on their part. I think it's a failure because I think, I think it's, it's a disservice to you as a board it's a disservice to my client, but my client put, has put a lot of time and effort in developing these projects and trying to find the right formula for parking and, 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 and occupancy of these buildings because the planning office, you as, as residents of the city, and all of us who have had a lot of experience in, in, in watching things develop over the years know it's, it's just as a pro, a, a problematic to build too much parking. It's our problem. We've seen it time and time again in areas outside of the city. I think the city has done a great job in revising its standards to determine what really works. And I think it was critically important here for us to be able to have looked at what actually this developer has been able to do and accomplish. And I think it's a shame that, that the objectors didn't think that it was going to be relevant. My clients introduced the issue of uh, the, the really innovative concept of car share. Now we know that car share, whether we want to call it zip cars, how, how we refer to it, my clients prepare to commit to a car share concept, uh, which we know has taken hold in other locations, but actually here in New Brunswick, there's a car share component in the, um, uh, the garage on, on the, uh, the view. Um, and you know, it's, it's becoming more and more relevant for people who really find it more convenient to do that than have a car. My traffic uh, um, expert testified statistically how what they've been able to find in, in the brief studies is that it significantly reduces the demand for vehicles for people who live in those facilities because they have the opportunity to schedule and, and drive those cars when necessary. And we're prepared to commit to that. My client was prepared and is prepared to pay for that, uh, the cost associated with committing the car share in the building. Um, we think that it would work without it, but we're prepared to do it because we think it's something that uh, is for the benefit of the residents that are there. I think it will help people uh, who are going to be residents uh, to be able to have some alternative, and we're prepared to commit to that uh, as a condition of, of approval. 
Uh, I think it's, it's unfortunate when, when objectors make fun of the elimination of parking permits being voluntarily given up, um, because I've seen that before. But the bottom line is, when you give up the parking permits, you can't park on the street legally. And the alternative, if you didn't do that, is you'd have additional residents, whether it's the 52 units or some less number, that would have more people who could park on the street. So the reality is, by eliminating those parking permits, you're creating an additional benefit to the residents in the neighborhood who don't have to compete with people in this building for parking legally. Uh, and it is, it is also a justification uh, in addition to, to allow for the parking variance. RSIS standards acknowledge it. Uh, I think that uh, all of us in the community would recognize that access to public and mass transportation uh, is very relevant, particularly for people who would be living in this location. The applicants provided ample testimony as to the availability of public, um, university, and mass transit opportunities in the immediate area and the walkability of this location to the campus and the availability of public parking in proximity to the building. Uh, some of the examples that were testified to, it's a five minute walk to the College Avenue campus, less than a five minute walk to the Student Center and to the Rutgers bus stop with over 10 bus lines. The Theological Seminary is 400 feet away from those seminarians living there. There are new bike lanes and pedestrian improvements are currently underway on College Avenue, being developed as a result of this very redevelopment plan, uh, which further encourages walkability and bicycle convenience for the residents. Uh, the New Jersey Transit bus stop is located just a short distance away on Easton Avenue. The New Brunswick train station, as even indicated by the Objectors Council, is is within, as he said, four blocks, I'll take that, four, four blocks from there to the train station. Um, it's mass transit. There's different opportunities for mass transit. You've got main line also on Somerset Street. Daily and monthly parking is available at the Gateway and Wellness Garages, and all within reasonable walking proximity to the location. Mr. Hughes testified as is required for us to, for the record, as I said, as a balancing test for the C2 variance. Positive versus the negative criteria. All of which I've outlined above provide a series of facts and circumstances which provide significant support and positive benefits to the public to grant a C2 variance. All those points underpin the positive rationale for seeing the variance as a positive decision to be granted rather than not in the public interest. Professional planner Keenan Hughes specifically laid out the balancing of all the positive reasons to grant the variance as opposed to any a possible negative impact. And I won't repeat them, you, you've heard his testimony. By promising less parking on site, the project will generate less traffic on the streets, particularly Mine Street, and have less vehicles entering and exiting the building. And I think that's important to know because the objectors have made a great deal about how congested Mine Street is, uh, how it's difficult to find parking. By reducing the number of vehicles, rather than attempt to comply with the requirement, uh, or, or at least placing more vehicles, you're, you're adding less traffic onto the street. So it's hard to argue both ways. I don't think the objectors want to see 96 parking spaces and 96 vehicles. So it's a positive to grant this variance because you've got less traffic. Your project is actually generating on Mine Street. It's a better designed building with parking in an enclosed garage and not overparked in a larger garage or worse, even a surface parking lot. A project that promotes walkability in a non-autocentric environment in close proximity to the campus and cemetery. And I would indicate, and I won't, re I won't recite them, but as you know, planners will generally indicate through their professional testimony, uh, also advances certain purposes of the municipal land use law, and he specifically identified purposes A, E, G, and H of the municipal land use law, which provides an underpinning to the benefits of this variance. Additionally, the project's intended to provide the correct number of parking spaces for this building and resist the mistake of overparking the facility. Thus, it's consistent with the city's stated master plan recommendation 
for parking needed for this type of facility and its vision for the College Avenue campus. And actually, Mr. Hughes didn't identify any discernible detriments to grant this parking variance. He also opined that this variance can be granted because it can be reconciled with the master plan. The overall project is designed to comply with the 2012 redevelopment plan, with the exception of the parking standard. Yet in 2012, coincidentally, as I indicated, the master plan re-examination re report identified a parking standard that this project complies with so it can easily be reconciled. With regard, very briefly, to the, to the waiver, and I'm not going to get into an argument. Uh, it's a legal issue that I assume somebody will deal with. This is a waiver. It is not a variance. It's in the site plan ordinance. It's always been treated by the city as a waiver. Mr. Bogan testified as to its adequacy, adequacy and, the, and the functionability of, of uh, the, the garage with the entryway and the 24-foot aisle width, as did um, my uh, traffic consultant, Mr. Oliva. Uh, so we stand by that testimony. I, I want to talk briefly about the historic district issue, this claim of the historic district. I wish to comment on the many references to the historic district that's been claimed by objectors. And I submit to you it's nothing more than a red herring, injected into this application in an attempt to create confusion and to imply that it creates some form of legal hurdle to the board in approving this application. Let's be clear on several points. Number one, there's been no determination made that there exists any historic district. The August 8, 2014 letter only indicates that they may pursue an application for registration, which has not occurred as far as we're aware. And I submit to you, I guess this is just another state bureaucrat. Because I don't know what makes my state bureaucrat any worse than his state bureaucrat. It's a red herring. There exists not a single property on Hiram Street or in the entire purported district that's listed either in the state or federal historic register. Now, I know they like to reference Mr. Drinkwater's beautiful home as an historic home. Maybe it could be a historic home, but it's not. It's not on the register. David's lived there for many, many years. He never took the steps to put it on the historic register. It's relevant because it's not relevant to this application. That fact matters. The information that gave rise to the letter from the state was from a survey of citywide properties conducted by the city as part of its 1980 tercentennial celebration. Since then, in 1980, since then not a single building mentioned in the survey has been listed as historic on any register. The 1980 survey was known and available to the property owners on Mine Street and the general public and didn't give rise to any interest in identifying a district for 34 years until now. And I venture to say that even as of this state, the majority of the property owners who own property in the area and on Mine Street, who would be affected by this designation, haven't been consulted for their opinions and advised as to what restrictions would be placed on their properties as a result. Notwithstanding, as has been previously stated and testified to, the design guidelines set forth in the redevelopment plan have been carefully considered by the design team in its revised building plan, which serves to better achieve harmony with the existing buildings in its vicinity on Mine Street. Those details have been testified to by my professionals, and I hope I've outlined them to you uh, to understand that there is a sensitivity to the existing buildings that are there. Uh, we recognize and, and no one's suggesting here that there isn't some impact on, on the immediate neighbor properties. We understand that. But we as an applicant have come here with rights with regard to a redevelopment plan that set standards that we complied with. Uh, and we, we, to a great degree, resent having these types of red herrings thrown at us. But we understand it because we do understand that there are impacts on people. That's what redevelopment sometimes does. But the redeveloper has, has rights as well. And I ask the board to consider that. I ask the board to consider, and again, appreciate all your time uh, with regard to all that's been put before you. 
once again, I don't want to get into the jurisdictional issues. I'm sure that will be dealt with at another time and place. Uh, but I, again, I appreciate your time, and I hope that the board will consider approval of what uh, we have before you in our application. Thank you, Mr. Kelso. We're going to take a five-minute recess. <clears throat>